OK, upgrades and feature flags. This is really cool, I think, uh, because this gets to one of the problems that really doesn't exist outside of software as a service. It doesn't exist so much in shrink wrap software, which is how do you upgrade something without having to stop people from using it? Right? How do you sort of upgrade the truck without stopping it rolling down the highway? Um, and the specific problem that makes this a challenge in software as a service is if you're running on more than one server, which is pretty common for uh, an application that has you know, more than a small number of users, uh, or in some cases, even if you're just running on one server, <clears throat> you might have uh, an upgrade that takes a certain amount of time to apply, and you would not like to bring the system down for that amount of time. One possibility is if you're running on n different servers, then at, at any given time, you know, you, you, it takes a certain amount of time to roll it out to each of those servers. And that means that at any given instant, some servers will have the old version of the code and some servers will have the new version of the code. So is your app written in such a way that it could continue to work in that case? Or do you have to guard against that? Um, and what's even harder is if you're making a change where you're changing both the code and the database schema at the same time. And the problem here is that if you upgrade the schema first, the current code will break because it expects the old schema. But if you upgrade the code first, the, uh, the new code won't work because the new code expects the new schema. So you know, how do you, up, do you upgrade them atomically? What do you do in cases like this? Um, now, if you can get away with the following, you should absolutely do so because this is the easiest way to do it. Take the service down, apply the migration, bring the service back up with the new code deployed. If you can do this, this is the right answer. Um, and if the time that it takes to apply the migration and bring the new code up, assuming nothing goes horribly, horribly wrong, is maybe it's on the order of just a few minutes. You might be able to just get away with that, right? If you're not Facebook, you can get away with a few minutes of downtime. You might, if you're really lucky, even be able to tell your users, we're going offline for scheduled maintenance, that magic word, right? From, from 2 to 4 AM on Sunday or something. Um, and if you have a small app used by people who are, are not going to be in front of their computers during that time, that's very reasonable. What do you do if, uh, if that's, you know, and by the way, let's look at a simple example of one of these. Here's a, uh, let's get rid of the service hooks thing. So here's an example of, uh, we're going to use this as a running example for our feature flags too, which is why I wanted to show it first. This is a pretty trivial change to the moviegoer's model of Rotten Potatoes, where instead of having a name field for the moviegoer, uh, I would like to have separate fields for first and last name. So that means that I have to not only have new code that relies on the new schema, but I've got to change in my migration. I've got to change what the existing code does. And here's a simple migration that will do it. I'll just take every single one, and I'll update the attributes, first and last name. Um, and this is a destructive migration, right? I'm adding these new columns, uh, and I'm removing the moviegoer's name column when I'm all done. So you know, at this point, any code that was relying on the old schema will stop working. But this is OK, because the idea here is we're going to stop the service, apply the migration, deploy the new code, and then the new code will come up. It will see the new schema. Everybody's happy. That's the easy case. What's the more fun case? The more fun case is when you have to do it incrementally. And this is where feature flags really help you. But here's the basic pattern. The idea is feature flags essentially let you have two copies of your app running at the same time, where the code path that you're going to follow is controlled by a var variable that you can change at runtime. So the pattern we're going to follow is first, we're going to break it up into pieces. First, we're going to do the non-destructive part of the migration. In other words, if we need to add tables or add columns or something like that, without destroying or removing existing data, we'll do that part first. Then we'll deploy new code where there's a method that could use the new schema, but it's conditioned on a feature flag, which we'll talk about. Um, once that's done, we now have a, a copy of the app that's got two code paths, one for the old schema and one for the new schema. And we can sort of upgrade it at our leisure as long as the feature flag says keep using the old schema. And then at an instant of time, we turn the flag over and we start using the new schema. And once the new schema and the new code are working properly, we can deploy a version where we remove all the old columns. In other words, we do the destructive part of the migration, and we remove all of the old code that isn't going to be used anymore. So let's walk through an example of how to do the same migration we just showed, but in the non-destructive manner using a feature flag. So remember what we did is we had to add columns for first and last name. Those are going to eventually replace the single column we have now for name, um, which means that we have to also migrate all of the records over to the new format. So here's how we could do that non-destructively. Um, here's the non-destructive part of the migration. All we're doing in this part is we're adding the columns. And we're also adding a Boolean column saying whether this particular entry in the table has been migrated or not. Uh, for reasons that we'll very soon see when we talk about database indices, we're also going to add an index 
on that Boolean field that we just added. So when we talk about indices uh, just a couple of segments from now, we'll come back to this example and you'll see why it's a really, really good idea to make sure the index is in place. So we apply this migration. We haven't changed the code. So everything is still working, right? The, all we've done is add stuff. We haven't uh, deployed any code that expects to look for it. So the next thing to do is to modify the code we have so that we can have two different code paths. Right? So remember active record scopes? Here's a great use case for them. We're going to define two different scopes for moviegoers. The old schema scope is any records where the migrated Boolean has not yet been set to true. And the new schema scope is the ones where, they have, where it has been set to true. Um, and let's suppose hypothetically that one of the methods in our app was find names matching a certain string. Clearly, we're going to have to change the implementation of that method if we're going to have a first and last name column versus just having a name column. So we're using a gem called Settler that includes a feature flags object where we can define methods that check whether, for example, this, uh, we're on the new schema or not. Right? So if, if we're looking at a record that uh, if the new name schema feature flag is turned on, that means that we actually have to look at two different things. Right? To match on the name, we've got to look at all of the records that are using the new schema. And for those records, we're going to check the column's last name and first name. We also have to look at any records that have not yet been migrated using the old schema. And in those records, we're going to check only the last name column. So we're really doing two computations, right? This is the code path that runs in the in-between state where we've deployed the new schema alongside the old one. We've deployed the new feature alongside the old code path. And we're in this kind of limbo where any given call to the method might have to use both. Otherwise, if the feature flag hasn't been turned on yet, then we'll just do what we always did, which is we just use the single column name that we were using before. OK, so what's the next step? Turn the feature flag on. Right? So at this point, um, we've got this same code rolled out to all the servers. We've applied the migration that adds all the new columns. Um, and there's one last thing we're going to do in this code, which is as we go, remember the before save callback, which is before you save a record, no matter whether it's a new record or an update, you can add a hook to do some additional computation there. Well, what we're going to do is Every time we are about to save a new record, we'll take the opportunity to update that new record to the new schema. Right? So uh, unless it's a record that's already been migrated, remember that's the Boolean flag that we, uh, we set up in our migration to uh, indicate whether this record is in the new schema or not, um, we're going to have this update schema method that we're going to use. And all it does is basically split the name, add, uh, save the first and last name columns, and set the migrated flag to show, OK, from now on, any computations involving this record can use the new schema. See how that works? So we're incrementally migrating the records one at a time opportunistically. Um, so now it's pretty interesting, right? That means that as soon as we, now what we haven't talked about is how you turn on the feature flag. But the assumption is that this is something that we can do while the app is running and that the feature flag value will be picked up without having to restart the app. So once we turn on that flag, all of a sudden we're going to start using this code path where we're, we can conditionally examine uh, both versions of a, uh, of a migrated record. And every time we update a record, we'll be slowly migrating the whole database, kind of one record at a time, over to the new schema. Once that's all done, we will eventually get to a point where the migrated flag is true for every record in the table. And once we get to that point, we can uh, apply another migration, which removes the old column, which we're sure is no longer used, removes the migrated field, which was only there to help us keep track during the migration process. And finally, we can deploy a new version of the code that takes out the feature flag check and only has the code path for the new migration. So it's, you're basically, uh, you, you have the ability to turn the feature flag on and off without restarting the app. And you know, what happens if something goes horribly, horribly wrong? Uh, well, you might think that back when we talked about migrations, there was an idea of having a down migration that is sort of the reverse version of the migration you applied. Um, you might think that that would be the way to back out or undo your way out of one of these disasters, but it's really not. Um, first of all, most down migrations don't get exercised very often, so they tend to be poorly tested. Um, not all migrations are reversible, and somebody else might have also applied a migration that's irreversible after the time that you did your feature flag rollout. So in fact, the only thing you can really do is do another feature flag and re-roll the, basically roll back to what you had, but you do it by rolling forward. You roll back by rolling forward. The down migrations are useful, but they're really there for development, right? To make sure that in development, you can easily back out a change to the database if things don't go as well as you liked. But in production, you're really just asking for trouble by using untested code. What else can you do with feature flags? Uh, you can do pre-flight checking. Suppose you have a new feature. You've done some testing, but you're not sure if it's going to have a disastrous effect on performance. 
Well, you could roll it out to a subset of users, say 10% of your users, and if nothing terrible happens to performance for those users, now you can roll it out to 30% of your users, and eventually all of your users will get it. So gradual rollout of a feature. Um, A-B testing, you've got two different ways of presenting, let's say, something in the user interface. You're not sure which one users will like better. So you could use a feature flag to determine who gets served which version and collect statistics on which one causes people to buy more books or whatever you're going to do. Um, if you have a complex feature that has code spanning multiple deployments, you still might need to use feature flags so that the, in, the uh, intermittent deployments don't break anything, but there's a big feature flag that you turn on at the very end that actually makes the feature visible to the end user. So a complex feature that you have to build up in many steps would be another use for feature flags. Um, and there's actually a gem called Rollout. You can find it on GitHub that, that supports all of these use cases as well as many more. So here's a question about feature flags given the discussion about uh, how they're used. Which one of these might be a poor place to store the value of the feature flag? And remember, it's just got to be a true-false value, right? All we need to know is, at runtime, which code path do we follow? Could we or should we store it in a YAML file, for example, in the config directory? Could we store it as a column in some existing table? Could we store it as its own separate database table? Uh, so is it the case that any, is any one of these three a bad place to put it? Or answer number four, these are all good places to store a feature flag.